one, two, three. Good morning, everyone. And it's a bright and happy Sabbath to you all. The sun is shining. We are in our right minds. We are in the house of the Lord. And to those who are on the wider um, virtual platform, on YouTube and also on Facebook, good morning to you in your own churches, in your own homes this morning. Good to have you with us wherever you are in whatever part of the world you're at. Right now we are assembled together in the presence of God. That's the best place anyone could ever find themselves to be. So put a smile on your faces. Good morning. And just enjoy being with God today. You know, you've read through things in the week of people passing away and high prices and crises going on around the world. But we have a God who still cares about us. And always keeps us in perfect peace despite what we are seeing and what we are experiencing. So every day we're facing a crucible of some kind. But our God is keeping us safe and sound even in this crucible. Let's just bow our heads for a prayer before we go into our study. Dear kind and eternal Father, hallowed be your name. Thank you so much for the way which you treated us throughout the week. You've put us in bed last night. You've brought us alive to this, this new morning. And we are grateful for everything you do for us. I pray that as we worship you on this, your holy Sabbath day, uh, that we will bring honor and glory to your name by how we conduct ourselves, what we say, what we do. May we show forth the praises of him who saved us, of Jesus Christ, our son. Be with your people now, Lord, both here in the church and also on the virtual platform. And when all is said and done, we finish studying through your word, may we be encouraged to trust you despite what we may go through. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers this morning. Hear your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As our custom has been for the last few weeks, we sing this song, Go Ye Therefore, and Teach All Nations. That's the purpose of us studying from week to week, to know what God is saying to us, but not only to know, but to go and share what God is saying to us. So we're going to do this a cappella this morning. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Baptize the name in the name of the Father and of the Son. Go, go, go. Receive he will lead out for us. And what God says to the disciples is saying to us today to go and tell somebody. Go ye therefore. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go, go, go. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go, go, go. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Ghost. Go, go, go. We'll do that again. Go ye therefore. Go, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go. Son and Holy Ghost. Go, go, go. Amen. Thank you so much. 
last week we studied about extreme heat. And as we read and studied last week's Sabbath, we spoke about how two weeks ago, it was really hot. 39 point something in Wolverhampton, I believe, 40 other parts of the country. One of the highest levels of heat we've ever seen. What we do know is that even as Christians, at times we go through some heat. Some really powerful heat. So, as anyone, we're going to rewind last week's study very quickly. What did you gain from last week's study as a quick recap? What did you gain from last week's study about extreme heat? The mic's ready, please. The microphone's ready. Thank you. Anyone from last week's study? Anyone gained anything from last study? From last week? Extreme heat. Yvonne? Good morning, everyone. Um, I would just say, as Jesus was with the three Hebrew boys when they were in the fiery, their fiery furnace, so Jesus will be with us when we go through extreme heat. Thank you, Ivan. As Christ, as disciples, as the three Hebrew boys, I've got people in mind this morning, as the Hebrew boy went through their extreme fiery furnace, God is saying to us, he'll be with you to your extreme heat. Just because you're wearing a nice suit and lovely church hats, and beautiful dresses. It doesn't mean you aren't going through the heat. Because smiling faces and the nice suits and the nice dresses sometimes hides the heat we're going through, really. And we say, Happy Sabbath. How are you doing? Good to see you this morning. But the heat is on. The heat can be so hot, but sometimes nobody sees it. Nobody knows it sometimes. But what God is saying to you, I'll be with you. When the heat comes up, I'll be your, 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 your way maker. I'll be the rain that cools down the heat. I'll be your fire, I'll be your fire, fire quencher. So all for the last five weeks, we've been talking about the, the, the crucible. And don't raise your hands, but you know whether you're in the heat right now. I know what heat I'm in, but we also know who is with us in the heat, as he was with the boys in the fiery furnace. Good point, Sonia. Abraham, extreme heat. He's now told to give up his only son. Extreme heat, a direction from God to go and do something. That's extreme heat. When God speaks to you and tells you, come on, do it this way. And you're thinking, Lord, are you really, are you, are you making sense? That's extreme heat. To do as God asks you to do those very tough decisions. But let's go on to our study for this week. And this is about not only extreme heat, but more importantly, the title of this week, right, listen, is Struggling with all energy. Strange, interesting title. Struggling with all energy. The opening text says in Colossians 1 verse 29, it says, to this end, I strenuously contend with all energy, Christ so powerfully works in me. To this end, I strenuously contend with all energy. Christ so powerfully works in me. Oh, Sonia, Sonia, Sonia. Microphone's coming. Microphone's coming to you. In the text in the Bible, it says, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Okay. Amen. Amen. So here we are, struggling strenuously 
but struggling strenuously with who? With Jesus Christ. Could somebody expand on that for me? Expand on that. I can go for it, but I want to expand. I want to hit interactivity. Expand on this. Struggling with all energy that comes from Christ. And when, when, when we feel the heat, and sometimes we serve in God, and there's others against you, there's, there, there can be a num- number of people against you, but you have to struggle through that crowd. You said Jesus is the only way for you, and you've got to make you got to persevere, you got to strain with all your energy to make it to prove to them that um, Jesus is the only way. Amen. Okay, thank you, Sonia. Anyone else? On Thursday evening, I or Wednesday evening, I watched the Commonwealth Games. The 10,000 meters Commonwealth Games. I think it's Alicia McLaughlin, I think her name is. And this is a long race. I don't know how many 10,000, I know 1,500 is three and three quarters round the track, three quarters time. The 10,000 is a lot. And there was this race going on. And this Scottish lady was running behind two, two Kenyans. And as the race came on, and we're coming to the final two or three laps now, where the, where the pain is, is going through your body now, all the muscles and the sinews are working over time now. And there she's just pacing away, and she's in, third, I mean, she's in third place. Then she was in first place. And one of the Kenyans had some kind of problem, so she had to step back, and she couldn't go as, as far or as fast as she wanted to go. Now we have two people running on this race, Liz and the other Kenyan runner. And the Kenyan runner took the lead now. And when they count to the final bell, ding, ding, the bell rings for the final lap. And they go around the lap now. At about 200 meters to go, the race is now building up. And the crowd is becoming frantic. Because they're hoping, favoritism, that, that is it Aelia McClough, look on the name, is it from Scotland, that she'll win. Because it's a, it's a home crowd the home crowd and the crowd in Birmingham are pumping up pumping up pumping up you go down to the final 100 meters and those of you watched it I must admit I was at home kind of banging on the table says, come on come on come on I don't know why I don't, I don't know who she is she's not who I am neither but I can come on come on more important she can't even hear my voice and come on come on I thought well let's go for the home crowd the biasness there and there she ran and she passed the Kenyan woman and she ran through and she won what she said in the interview was that it was the crowd who brought us through the final 100 meters. It was the crowd that kept her going. She's in pain, and the pressure's on. It's a long race. The heat is on now, but it was the crowd that took her through the final 100 meters. And as I watched her triumphantly, I thought to myself, You and I go through the heat. Do we sometimes forget that we have unseen crowds of spiritual beings watching us run and saying, Pamela, come on. Mr. Otty, come on. I ain't going to win this race. I'm going to just pack up right here right now. Go on. Rest of you just go through and win. Go on. Two into one. She had to combine her humanness with the crowd's emotion to pull her through the final stretch. And God is saying to us through the verse this morning that we can contend what by the power of God working through us, we can get through our heat-filled moments in life. That you are never alone. And Ellen White states, I love his text, she mentioned that Every person has one guardian angel. That means for me now, when the heat is on and I think I'm by myself, I'm not. There's always a... I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, go on. But...
That's correct. Amen. And the Bible says that even those who have died can still hear the voices. Abraham's life still lives on for us. Christ's life still lives on for you. Jacob and Joseph, even though they're in the grave, their lifestyle still calls out to you. And even though I've never heard God speak audibly, he speaks to my heart and speaks to our hearts and tells us to keep on running. Therefore, Paul is saying to you, you don't run alone. You run with the power that God will work with you to bring you through your crucible experience. Any thoughts before I go any further? Wilfred? Yeah, um, the class is too quiet for my comfort personally. Uh, oh, let's go to the memory verse again. Who is talking here? Who is saying that he is fighting? He is struggling. Who, who is talking here, class? Let, let, let's, thank you, Sister Sonia. Let's answer the question first. Who is talking here? You don't sound convincing. Who? Right. Let, 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 let's, let's think about Paul. Who is Paul? What did he do? Wrote how many uh, books in the New Testament? 13 out of 27. That's almost 50%. And then he contributed maybe an additional seven more books in the New Testament were written by his disciples. They are based, in other words, on his uh, teachings and on his life. And, and this is the man who was incarcerated several times because of the gospel. Am I right, class? And this is the man who was shipwrecked at least two times in my right class. And this is the man who performed some miracles in my right class. Liberated the young girl who was following them at one time and uh, cast out the demons. Am I right about that? No, the church doesn't remember. <laughs> Never mind. Um, um, am I right that this is the man who sang and praise God while he was in jail. All right, thank you very much. But now here he is testifying that though I wrote so many, so many books of the Bible, though I cast out demons, though I healed so many people, and though I talk about I have fought a good fight, yet in my little life, I'm opening a window to my life to you. I struggle. Hello, class. He says, I struggle and I fight. And he says, the person I'm fighting with, the person I'm struggling with, it's Jesus. Because Jesus is giving me so much energy to try and keep me in the Christian path. But my desire, my inclinations, my taste, different. Is there anybody in class here who says I identify with Paul? Am I the only one? Let me see the hands. I, I like a participating class. Let me see the hands who says I, I identify with Paul. Thank you very much. And so the, the, the lesson here is telling us that maybe your greatest enemy is not that church or the pretty sister or the handsome tall and dark gentleman. Maybe that's not your greatest enemy, but your greatest enemy is your own desires because you want to do something, but you know it's not right. You, you, you want to indulge a little, but you know it's not right. And so every day, every hour, you are struggling with that, but when you come here, like Paul, you are able to tell the demon, out! And the demon goes out, but in your private life, you are struggling. Is there anybody who can identify with that? That's what the text is talking about. You are struggling, and your fight is not against an enemy, but your fight is against Jesus himself. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come to that, Sonia, a bit later on. Is it okay? Is it okay? We'll come to that a bit later. We're going to go quickly through this. So, this is about, in summary, your willpower. 
Could somebody define what is willpower? What is willpower? We talk about you must have the willpower to do this, willpower to succeed, willpower to pass examinations, willpower to go through a, a difficult moment in your life. Could someone define, summarize, when we say willpower, what do we mean? I won't have the dictionary definition, but what came to my mind is Paul. Though Paul was going through what he was going through, and though the Christians rejected him, and they beat him, they spat at him and everything, he was determined. He was purpose in his mind. It doesn't matter what men do to me. My desire is to serve God until the end. And that's the encouragement for us today. And on top of that, it's also, what do you do when you know that you've caused a situation and you feel as if you've messed up something? Because remember, the greatest tool starts here in your mind. This is where the victory is won or the victory is lost in the crucible. It's in our minds, how we ruminate, how we think, what we think about. Everything is, is here. And what did Paul say? It wasn't the same Paul who says, what I should do, I don't do. And what I do, I shouldn't do. And he's battling, he's battling in Romans 7. So we're going to go through very quick as a time is look at how the willpower is so important in helping you to overcome and helping you to contend with Christ and helping you to understand despite your willpower, you have to choose God first in order to help you get over to the crucible. So, spirit of truth. I'm going quickly because of time. Spirit of truth. What is truth? What is truth? Anybody, what is truth? What do you mean by Jesus Christ? Okay, Paul says, Jesus Christ, the truth, the light, the way. Isn't there different truths in the world? Aren't there different truths? We have President Trump saying, that's fake news. He's saying, he's saying that the truth of him losing the election, it's all fake. That's, that's fake. So quite clearly, he says that there's a truth and there's fake truth. So how do we know what is truth? Isn't it relative? Is it up to me what truth is? What is truth? What is truth? Hear, 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 hear what Sonny said earlier. Hear what Sonny said earlier. What is truth? Expand on what Sonny has said. What is truth? Nobody knows what truth is. We, we all were here today on Sabbath. Why we, what are you doing here then? You don't know what the truth is. Why are you here this morning in the church? Why are you on the platform? Why are you on Facebook? Why are you on YouTube? What are you watching? What, what are we here for? What is truth? Right. Mm -hmm. it, when, when Pilate asked Jesus what is truth, he did not stop to, um, to hear the, to get the reply. Right, he went out to the crowd. But, but he had the truth in front of him. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Jesus Christ, what the way, the truth, and the light. So the truth is anything that's in Christ is true. And in order to know what truth is, you have to stand in front of Christ to know what truth is. Now, sometimes having the truth can be quite painful because the truth will sometimes highlight your untruths in you. It's like painting a wall. And there's one black dot on the wall. It stands out. This part has been a perfect painted wall. One dot on the wall stands out. Because sometimes the truth of Jesus Christ shows me where I'm going wrong. Which is why Christ says in, in John 14 for time and John 16, I give you the spirit of truth that will teach you all things. Elder Green. Yes, I was going to come on something similar to that. Okay. So when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. That means the spirit of God is all truth, and he will guide you into all truth. So we have to trust in God to guide us at all times. He's going to reprove you, he's going to trust him, he'll convict you of sin. And what is the reason? Why does the Spirit of God show you these things? What, what's the purpose of showing you 
what is truth and what is untruth probably in your own life. What's the reason? Why is he showing you the truth in the crucible? To live, to live a better life with him and we can turn to the Father and the Son. Whenever Christ shows us the truth, it has salvation behind it. Whenever Christ shows you the truth, it shows us the right way we're going to go to. Because we're darkened by the things of the world. When the Spirit of Truth comes and speaks to you and speaks to us, it shows you the better way and the right way. And if we do things God's way, then the right path. Receive. So I've got a question. We all know that it's in the word, the truth, and the truth is Christ. But we all come to church and we still come with different perspective, different angles of a specific scripture. So how do we determine that it's easy to say, oh, the truth is in Jesus Christ, but then we still have confusion. What's my truth may not be your truth. So how do we go about that? Good question. And when I answer that question, we come here different perspectives. We also got the truth, but I might believe something slightly different to Elder Naomi, to Joshua, to Racine. Why is there sometimes confusion? Why, what's happening? Um, Errol. Um, I think as, um, I believe that when we acknowledge that we are sinners saved by grace and that we understand that although we are walking the straight and narrow way, um, we still have our struggle to overcome. I um, think it was in, um, if it's when they are the lesson, he's talking about uh, the straight path. But on that straight path, there are things on that straight path that um, can um, tempt us or distract us. So although we are walking the straight and narrow path, we are still a sinner. And we're still going to fall. We're still going to make mistakes. But the most important thing of all of us who are here today, that we know that Jesus Christ will crucify and die for us, and he is the only one who can save us and can guide us. So although we might have our differences, or we might have our belief, but the one belief must be in Jesus Christ. And that's the main thing. Our different understanding of who God is, but as long as we understand that he was from the beginning, and he only him can save us, and we acknowledge that we are sinner, we are not good, we are bad. You understand? We have to realize that he's there, that everything that we accomplish that is good is through the spirit of God. Because we cannot accomplish anything good. When we do good, it's the spirit of God that us do good. And when we fall, it's the spirit of God that we are fall. When we are, when we are sinning, it's the same spirit that us that we are doing wrong. So we have to, we have to acknowledge he's there that it's only Christ can save us. And the lesson talk about persevering. So no matter how distressed you are, and no matter how hard the road might be, keep on pressing on, because okay. the end, that straight and narrow road leads to life. Thank you, thank you. Nessie? I was just going to say, I think, um, it's not confusion, I think sometimes we probably read uh, a scripture in the, the Bible, and sometimes it's we do not understand. And it's like we're discussing here now, the different, you know, scriptures. Um, this is why we need to pray for the Lord to give us wisdom and enlighten our minds. And also, as we come together as a church, we can discuss, and we can, as it says, iron sharpen it iron. So we can discuss the different scriptures that we've read and we can come to a better understanding. Amen. Good point. Last point. Stacey, last point, very quickly. Thank you, Nettie, for that great point. Thank you, Errol. Um, I, um, I believe that if you look, in, um, um, look at all the disciples, oh, God will sometimes reveal to them different things in the scripture, and sometimes a, a, a sister or a brother will come with different things. But if we're not one in the spirit, um, sometimes it becomes confusion. But if we call for the Holy Spirit when we are about to read the word, um, even if an, another sister or another brother sees something, it doesn't mean it's confusion. It means that um, just God is just showing things differently to everyone and differently. 
but it, it, it will all lead to Jesus Christ when we finish. Good point. Good point. So in there, we may have different viewpoints. The disciples did. The disciples had, they, were, they were with Christ in his midst. But what did God do? Through the Holy Spirit working through them, he brought them into a unified position over time. And God is using the Holy Spirit to show you and I that sometimes the crucible that you're going through is sometimes our own fault. It's painful to say sometimes. But at times, the crucible we go through is our own fault. I told you to some people last week that I had to go and purchase something some time ago. And I dallied and I dallied and I dallied. And, I dallied and God was saying to me, well, do it this way, do it this way. And I didn't. And it cost me so much money. So much money. Because why? And God had said to me, Mark, but I told you the way to go. I showed you the truth. And it didn't go my way. So it was a painful experience to know. But sometimes God is, is so merciful. He'll allow us to stay in the crucible with the truth to show us where we need to get back to where we should be. We love his chastises. So sometimes the crucible you go through is something that you've done of your own volition. But God in his mercy still allows the Holy Spirit to convict you, to bring you back to repentance, and to rebuild you back to where you should be. So don't disregard the crucible that you sometimes have to go through. You can learn from you in the day. But I'll tell you very quickly, and then both are going to go to Tuesday. Time goes so quickly in here. Now, I said this before, and I'll say it again. It is the spirit that controls the mind. And the mind controls the body. Now, many people believe that there's just one spirit. But it's not. You have the Holy Spirit, and you've got the evil spirit. And one of those spirits at some time will control our mind. And that's where it works from. <clears throat> from our mind to our bodies, we start to do either good or bad. And quick, very quickly, remember, in order for the Spirit to take control of your life, you have to do what? Any Spirit. What must you do first? Choose? Yeah. We have a choice to make. We can choose. When the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit Pentecost, they, because they chose to be in the right place with each other. So with what the Bible is saying, we have a, a human and a divine combination to take here. We can choose which way to go. With, me, my, with my bad financial decision at the end of the day, I'm thinking, mm -mm, never again. I taught, I taught me a lesson. I'm through it now. I taught me a lesson. But ultimately, what God is saying, choose this day who you'll serve. Make the right choices every day and go on the pathway. Wilfred, over to you, circle of time. The, the truth, the truth is a person. That's Jesus, isn't it? But the truth is also the Holy Spirit. But then the truth is also the word of the Lord. That's the standard. You know you're right or you're wrong or you're in the right path based on the word of the Lord. And to put it in the context of the lesson that we are focusing on, it's not the confusion about the truth that we are struggling with. We know the truth, but we don't want it. And in fact, no, I'm, I'm not quite right there. We want the truth, but we also don't want the other side of it, or the opposite of it. I didn't say it right. Hello, class. We know the truth, amen? We want the truth. But at the same time, I want a bit of what is not the truth. And that is what we are talking about. And it's not an easy thing because the two don't marry together. Hello, somebody. Hello, class. The two don't marry. I want the truth. I want to keep the Sabbath holy. 
But I also want to watch the Commonwealth Games on the Sabbath. And the two don't go together. So if the result is a war within me, it's like I'm saying, should I go or should I stay? Hello, class. That's what we're talking about. That's the issue here. The war is an internal war. This time, we are not looking at an enemy. We're not looking at the Hevites and the, uh, what are they called? The Edomites, uh, the Canaanites and all those. We're not looking at them. We are not looking maybe uh, at your haters or your enemies. We are looking at you fighting Jesus. You want him, but only to a certain extent. Now, are we clear so far? We want Jesus, but not the whole of him. We love Jesus. We've been baptized. We sing. We pray. And yes, we are elders. Hello, church. Are, are we together here? L let me have your contribution. I think that's absolutely normal. Just name me one person in the Bible, a human mortal who was born the normal way after God created Adam and Earth, who didn't have that struggle. And is not that struggle maybe just something to say that we strive, we know what we want to hang on, and hopefully out of that struggle we will come out victorious again, that we wrestle just something down which isn't really meant to be. David struggled, Paul struggled, even Jesus struggled to a certain extent, but he always overcame it, at least just it looks very easy. But if you look how the devil tried to tempt him, there was a struggle. So all the big patriarchs struggled, but they sometimes lost, but at the end they came out. I think just like if we would have those big people in the Bible who just like always done it easy, they just sailed across, they always made the right decision. I would find it difficult in times where I struggle, where I might have lost a battle, but I want to win the war, just to focus my view on those and say, well, I'm not alone in that big struggle, but I know where I want to go. And the straight line where I see the cross is there. I sometimes might fall to the left, I sometimes might fall to the right but I know where my straight path is. And I think that struggle will stay with us, that we will have those things, shall I do this or shall I do that? Um, and I think that's absolutely normal. If we wouldn't struggle, I don't know, sometimes I wonder if something would be maybe just a little bit wrong, if we just pretend everything is fine, because we can have some people sometimes pretend everything is okay which it isn't, and they lie to themselves. As long as we always know, as long as, like Mark said, like you said, the inner voice always says, hold on, is that really truly what God wants to do? Is that truly what, how you should just like keep the Sabbath? And if we listen it, a struggle will be there, but a struggle needs to be overcome. An athlete struggles just to in his training, but he sees the big goal. And as Paul beautifully said in that one, you have to put the big race ahead, struggles will come. But you have to know what is the goal and just like coming back to that. It will be painful putting certain things aside, saying, like you said, for example, oh, I would really would watch, it's just my type of sport today and I really would watch. But if you can overcome that, I think it makes you feel good that you wrestled something down and you just put Jesus first and you can just like bring that further and that only will make you stronger because you say and that applies to people wanting to give up smoking wanting to lose weight wanting to change their lifestyle wanting to achieve something wanting to learn a skin I could do it with that so I can do it with that so that builds uh, our character and helps to build our resilience up so I thought it can be painful, it can be a big wrestle, and you might wrestle the whole day with that. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, if you're able to overcome it, even if maybe your mind is not completely focused, I think you should be proud on that. And that will help you just like to get more resilient next time. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we, we left with 16 minutes, isn't it? 16 minutes. Now, here is the key. 
if you are struggling, like Brother Will is struggling and Brother Mark is struggling and like Brother Paul struggled, there's nothing wrong with you. That means you are a normal person and this is part of the war that characterizes us as Christians. The Bible does give us some tools that can help us. Remember here, the struggle we're talking about is not against evil. Uh, I don't know. It's, 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 it's against Jesus. You are struggling against Jesus. So, uh, some of the tools that we are given, we, 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 Paul s says, there's so many, there's a cloud of witnesses. But what I do is I keep my mind on the prize. So, in other words, stay, stay away from anything that kind of puts you in a position where you will be more vulnerable to temptation than is normal. Take away that drink that is forbidden and put it somewhere in the sink and lock the cupboard if that will help. Rather than put it in a fridge where every time you open the fridge and you see it and say, ooh, it's chill. Am, am I saying something here? Yeah, so uh, keep your eyes focused on the price. You know that the Lord wants you to be saved. Keep your eyes at the cross. Am I right? That's one of the two. The other tool that it says here, remember the decision is yours. God is giving you all kind of help. But all the help that he has given us, they are conditional. And one of the crucial conditions is that you, yes, you, have to make a decision. You have to consciously choose what you want. And so even though the Holy Spirit is, is digging at you, is trying to prompt you to do the right thing, you've got to say, I'll say yes, Lord, yes. Because if you don't, the Holy Spirit does not have power over you. And therefore, Wilfred, that means that there's one thing that God can't do. But God can do anything, can't he? He can do absolutely anything. But what he won't do and can't do is force you to go his way. Therefore, the human and divine have to be combined at certain stages to make the right decision. I can't say I won't be saved by God's kingdom. I just sit here all day, I just stand here. I'm not praying, I'm not studying, I'm not reading. Lord, just when you come, just translate me to heaven. Oh, hallelujah. It doesn't work that way. I have to do something. It says, it says to us in, in Proverbs, I believe, don't give me your heart. I've got a role to play in this. And when we combine with the, with the divine, our salvation can be secure. So for those of you who follow the lesson day by day, the Tuesday lesson basically is telling us that our natural inclinations, my taste buds are designed to love anything sweet. Hello, class. Yeah. My natural inclination is to like anything that will make me a little high. Am I talking to you here? Yeah, anything that will make me a little high. That's my natural inclination. You find that if I take anything that makes me high, I'm more happier. Am I right, church? I appear a little happier. That's the natural inclination. So the Bible says there in Jeremiah, the heart is what? Deceitful. Because you have all these natural inclinations, but then you have to make a conscious uh, commitment, uh, effort, determination that I will say no to this, even though I feel like, you know, helping myself a bit. Somebody wants to talk to the class? Comments on this? That was Wednesday. Everything about us, the tendency is to go the ungodly way. All right? And that, oh.
Um, I agree with what you're saying, but um, I kind of like differ a bit on the solution. Why I think the solution is um, that you are suggesting is kind of like prescriptive, and when it's prescriptive, it tends to make me boast because it's me who has done something. But the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And I'm just looking at the screen there, it says, you must be born again. Jesus' solution to Nicodemus' problem was, you must be born again. In other words, the rebirth in Christ changes your natural inclinations. The things that you like, you like no more. I'll give you an example. You know, if you go to a group of people that's going to the pub and smoking, is natural to them. To them, it looks normal. But to you, it doesn't look normal. When you see someone light up, it looks strange, isn't it? Why? Because Christ has changed you. And Christ changes us daily as long as we abide in him. And when he has changed us, though we don't feel like we are sacrificing by not doing those evil things. It's because Christ has changed our very nature. When we are in that new mode and we are that new creation, those things that were appealing don't appeal no more. Our nature is changed. Pamela? And also very quickly, also, it's important. When I serve Christ, don't go by your feelings. Don't go by his heart is deceitful. Do not go by your All feelings right. in your service of God. Amen, Elder. I can expand on that, but time is going. Amen. Don't go by your feelings. Though we accept Christ, like my brother said, um, when you are born, when you accept Christ, now you are a new creature. The old man is put away. But as long as we are going on the journey, there will always be trials. There will always be a crucible time. Like Elder said, Paul said, the good I want to do, I find myself not doing. There is a struggle there. In Matthew 5 verse 29, he said, let me read it. Um, but I say unto you that whosoever, verse 20, Matthew 5, verse 29, he said, and if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. So for you to go to heaven, if your right eye offend you, pluck it out. If your left hand in 30, if your right hand offend you, cut it off just for you to make it to heaven. So it's not an easy road. We will go through all these obstacles and crucible. But God is saying, look on the price, as you mentioned. Look on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Job went through his, and whatever he was going through, he said, though you slay me, yet will I trust you and hold on to the end. Because God never leave us. He always by our side to hold us as long as we keep faithful going through our crucible times. Amen, Sister Barbara. Oh, okay. All right. I, I, I see I see the hands. I see the hands. Let's really be, make it concise. We are left with 10 minutes. Is it possible for us just to clarify what God is really saying when he says, if you right eye, pluck it out, and your hand, cut it off? Because we know that our bodies are temples. We know that God is not into self-mutilation. So can we please clarify and make sense of what the Bible is saying here, please? Brother Taylor, are you going to answer that? Brother Taylor, answer, I answer the question. Can I just go back to the... Sorry. Okay, sorry. In, in Tuesday lessons, um, Matthew 5, verse... I was just giving, like, a go, little go summary. Over, go verse 28. 28 and 29. Okay, go Yes, yeah, so I was just giving a little summary, not to go in depth. But it's saying that if thy right hand offend thee. Go back one. Oh, hold on. Go back one. Further. Go to verse 28. 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman right. to lust after her had committed adultery okay. with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For, okay, so it's talking about what you're looking at. So if you're looking at a woman and you start to be lost already, in verse 29 said, if your eyes gonna, your right eye is going to offend you, causing you to sin and preventing you from entering the kingdom, get rid of the eye just for you to make it to the, end, to, to, keep, to the kingdom of God. Okay. So, so that's why it's saying so, so, sorry, in, twen in 28, he said that if you look on the woman, you're going to lose. That's the eyes you used to lose. 
Th thank you, Bamra. You, you, but it's a bit more deeper, but because of time consuming, I thought that you it, studied it, the lesson so you'd have a little bit of idea. Uh, okay, hold, hold on. Um, Barbara went a little ahead of me because I was on Tuesday. She jumped on to Wednesday. But anyhow, let's hear what the, the, the lesson study, this, the lesson study actually answers that uh, question um, asked by um, or the contribution that Ruth asked. It, I, I'm reading from the quarterly here. So this is not my saying, it's the, it's the author. Jesus isn't calling us to harm our bodies physically. Not at all. Rather, he is calling us to control our minds and therefore our bodies, no matter the cost. Amen. Shall we now proceed, please? We, we left with five minutes. Um, beloved, I wish there was one solution be born again and be baptized and your struggles are over but that's not the case we've got to fight on and we fight until our last breath uh, the, 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 the lesson on Thursday it, it takes us back to Jacob and it's all about persevering. But I think it will be amiss not to consider how God was giving so much energy to Jacob so that Jacob could be what he wanted him to be. And the problem with Jacob was he was resisting all that energy. Remember the, the, the memory verse? I was still together, class. We are still talking about struggling with the energy that comes from Jesus. In other words, fighting Jesus. Jacob is with his uncle Laban, and the word of God comes to him and say, leave and go back to the land of your father. But as soon as that word comes, he does not reflect on the word more, but he reflects on the possible potential problem that lies ahead. And because of the problem, a struggle ensues in his mind. Are we together, class? Because too many times we are thinking of issues rather than what the Lord says. And the, the result is a struggle, an internal struggle. And so Jacob had to struggle with that. But when he struggled, the Lord came in and changed Laban, who was going to destroy Jacob for running away with his daughters and his grandchildren and all that and all that. And the word came to Laban and said, don't. But even though the word of the Lord came to Laban through a dream, this is um, Genesis chapter 31, Jacob still struggled with God because God says, go. But as he goes, he fears. And so there is a fight. Can you see the fight in him? And when he is fighting, God sends him another energy power. I'm now in chapter 32 of Genesis. He sends him two angels. Genesis chapter 2, 32, verse 1, I think. The Lord sends him two angels. This is the power, the energy that the Lord is investing. But even though for a moment he's excited and happy that I've met angels, I'm encouraged, no sooner do the angels leave does Jacob go again and fight the energy of God. And when he struggles, he starts to plan, what will I do? Let me divide my camp into two. And when he looks at that, he's still not content. He says, let me appease my brother with all these. In all that, Jacob was fighting God's will because God said, go. But he is reluctant to go. Even uh, he went and prayed, confessed, 
And the Lord answered his prayer, but even after praying, and this is for you and for me who, who, who believe in prayer, rightfully so, and for you and me who believe that more prayer, more what? Uh-huh. But after praying, Jacob still finds himself doing what? Struggling. And I don't know about you, beloved, but that's me. Because sometimes, even after praying, I, feel, I, I still find I'm still in a war. But that's not to discourage us. That's to tell us that we have to continue. Because Jacob, even though he was so weak, so compromising, so full of uh, lack of faith, uh, look at him. The Lord sends him an angel not to fight him, but to bless him. But because he is so clouded in his mind about fighting and because this is his nature he's always fighting and running away what does he do when he see the angel of the lord he wrestles all night long it is only at the dawn of the day that he realizes no i shouldn't this man is not here to kill me but to bless me that he now say bless me i'm not letting go until you bless me the, the key thing here is we are always fighting. And if you are not fighting, amen. But if you are fighting, amen, don't give up. The lesson on Thursday is persevere. Hold on until the Lord blesses you. It comes at a cost. It comes with a struggle. It's not, a give, it's not something that is easy but it will always be a war. And the war, like I said earlier on, is not the pretty woman, nor is the dark and handsome gentleman, but it's something that I know what the Lord wants me to do, but I, I don't want it. I want it, but I don't want it. And so in the end, it's a confusion, it's a conflict within me, but there still is hope. Hold on. That's the lesson on Thursday. Can Hold quickly, on. Can very quickly. Also, remember the lesson about us contending with God. Yes? When we go wrong and we find ourselves in the crucible, we contend with God. But Jacob's story says one thing to us. The very person who I'm contending with is the very person I need to be blessed by. The very person I'm battling against is the very person I need to bless my soul. And that means he must see something in you and I, not to cast us to one side, but will take us through a crucible experience because he wants to save us from ourselves and from Satan. We fight against him, but he also blesses our soul at the same time. Right. We, 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 are, we, we, are, we are summarizing now. The person who declared, who opened a window in his, into his life was Paul, based on the memory verse. Hello, class. Hello, class. The person who opened a window into his other life, because we like the glorified life. But Paul says, yes, brethren, I have a really high and glorified life, but there is also a gory part of my life. And that gory part of my life is the struggle against all this energy that Jesus infuses me with. But then we are looking at Jacob and we are saying that God is desperate to save you, to save me. God is aware of the struggle that you are going through and he's not willing to give up. But for him to be effective in your life, there's got to be a desire in your heart. There must be a willingness to say yes to him. Now, I asked a question earlier on, is Paul alone in this fight? Or maybe I should say, is Paul just with Brother Will in this fight? The good thing is the Lord is with you. Are you going to say yes to his will? Let me see the hands of those who will say yes to his. Amen. Pray Amen. for us, Elder. Amen. Let's all bow our heads.
as we pray. And thank you for your participation this morning. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you so much for speaking to us today. You understand that even in our lives, like poor life, what we should do, we don't always do. And what we shouldn't do, we do. So often we are battling with you and we find ourselves in the crucible because of our own decisions. But we thank you that you are merciful. And we thank you that you are faithful. And we thank you that salvation is always found in your hands. As you now show us the truth, help us to bow our heads before you, to repent of our failures, and to allow you to restore us back to your own character. All you desire is that we serve you and that we see you on that day. Father, as you take us through this crucible experience, it may be painful, it may be sometimes traumatic, but we still thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have a plan for us through this crucible to bring us through the crucible that we can come before you as pure gold. Bless your people here this morning in the church on the wider platform. Help us to cooperate with you, to listen to you, to learn from you. And Father, because we do these things, when the trumpets sound, when the clouds roll back, when the Christ comes with his angels upon thousands upon thousands of angels, because we have given ourselves wholly and totally to you, and we have been cleansed by you, we shall now be saved eternally into your kingdom. Bless your people. Stay with us. Have mercy upon us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, class. Thank you all this morning. Thank you. Life is full of surprises, but sometimes God gives us surprises, and sometimes those surprises can be delightful. We had a herd of llama that we rescued uh, from the fire and got them down to safe pastures. And a month and a half later, all of a sudden, here was this baby in the herd. And he just was born, and it was a surprise. We didn't know he was coming. And he turned out to be the biggest warm fuzzy, not just for us, but for our community. And it was like God gave us this stuffed toy. He was, from the beginning, just a people lover. In fact, when he first stood up when he was born, he went straight to a child and just went up to him. And since then he's loved people, he loves dogs, and he loves children. And we realize this, this little guy is so tame, maybe we should uh, make him a therapy llama, a comfort animal. And right now, llamas are all the rage. There, there are pictures of llamas, there are, you can buy toys, there's all these things, and, and, and God gave us a real one. And it's just been such a delight to share. And God has been opening all these doors for this little llama whose mother carried him through the fire and we named Phoenix Hope. It's a name that our, our fellow survivors can connect with immediately. All we have to do is tell them his name is Phoenix Hope and they get it. And they go, of course. <laughs> and, and you know, I realized that um, you know, God's timing knows no haste and no delay and because he knows what he's going to do ahead of time and he's got the plan and that's what Phoenix taught me to do for him 
is I knew what I wanted to do with him, where I was going to take him, what we were going to do that day, but I needed to be gentle and soft and slow. And I realized that's how God talks to me. Maybe we should use him for God's work and glory and bring joy to everyone. And so why not use him as a comfort animal, as a therapy llama? And that's what we've been doing. Uh, we've been taking him up the hill every week, once a week. Uh, it's our Friday tradition. And he stands in front of the clinic and he just greets everyone that comes. And he acknowledges every single person, makes each person feel important because he goes right up and touches them with his nose and says, I'm interested in you. And who are you? And I want to be with you and pet me. And it's just been an amazing, unexpected joy and delight. And it's just so wonderful because the more people he greets, the calmer he becomes. And he's just so interested in every single person. He will go right up to them. And the way you say hello in Lama is by touching with your nose. And so he'll touch people's hand or if they put their face down, they'll, he'll touch their nose. And it's just as soft and, warm and fuzzy as a, a rabbit. Well, Phoenix doesn't have to do anything except just be there. And he makes us happy and he gives us joy. And he does that for everybody that see him and they touch him and he's so soft and fuzzy and he just cheers us up. We are here because we cheer God up. We make him happy. We exist for his joy and his glory. You're looking around the clinic and everything is just destroyed. It's like a war zone. But when people see him, they focus on him completely. And that's just what, what God did for us through him. Uh, God gave us this amazing little distraction to get our focus on his creation and, and to just really stabilize us uh, emotionally and realize that there's, there's other things to set your mind on. After they took the city of Jericho and moved inland, there was still a lot of work to do. The land was occupied, but this was the area God had promised he would give them. He had promised that if they diligently kept his commandments and followed him, that he would clear out the land and drive out the nations from the river Euphrates to the Mediterranean. They were warned that if they didn't do this, the people would be a constant thorn in their side. Sadly, they failed to heed the advice given them. And Judges 1 verse 28 says that they failed to utterly drive them out. They chose the course of ease and they mingled and intermarried with the various heathen tribes around them. Soon heathenism and idolatry spread amongst the Israelites and they served as captives in the land that had been promised them. The king of Mesopotamia, Eglon, king of Moab, the Canaanites and the Philistines all became oppressors of Israel. On each occasion, God raised up a deliverer. Othniel, Shamgar, Ehud, Deborah, and Barak. There was a cycle. They fell into captivity and remained in captivity until they cried out to God for the deliverer. Then God raised up a judge who delivered them, and they were free from captivity often as long as the judge was alive. Then when the judge died, they fell back into apostasy and captivity. So often this is the case with us. We have ups and downs in our spiritual lives, sometimes strong and sometimes weak. Before crossing the River Jordan into Israel, the Midianites had almost been wiped out. 
but a small number remained and over time they grew, became powerful and oppressed Israel for seven years. God raised up Gideon to deliver his people. Gideon was hesitant to take on the call and asked God three times to show evidence that he was with him. After whittling down his men from 32,000 to 300, he won the battle in the most extraordinary way. God was making a point. I am the one who has the power. Trust me and not yourselves. But perhaps the most famous judge in Israel had a very mixed reign, and his name was Samson. Born into the tribe of Dan in the family of Manoah, he was consecrated as a Nazarite at birth. No wine, no unclean foods, and his hair was not to be cut. However, living close to the Philistines, he mingled with them and married one with disastrous results. Then he was a judge for 20 years. As he got older, though, his old weaknesses came back, and he was ultimately seduced by Delilah to give away the source of his strength. As a prisoner to the Philistines, he ended up killing more Philistines at his death than during his life, and it's believed he is buried here at the top of this hill. Many of the judges did have disadvantages. Ehud was left-handed, Gideon was outnumbered. Samson, though, did have physical strength, but maybe this contributed to his downfall because he trusted in his own strength rather than in the one who was the source of his strength. God was always trying to teach his people to rely on him, not to rely on their own strength, not to rely on the strength of their armies, but to rely solely on him. He who had brought them from Egypt to Canaan miraculously would deliver them if they trusted in him. God wants us to have a consistent walk with him, not one that goes up and down all the time, but for us to learn to trust implicitly in him based on how he has led either us or others in the past. When we remember how good God has been to us, we can know and have the assurance that when we confront obstacles that seem insurmountable, such as the Midianites to Gideon, we can know that God has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. communities where the nearest safe water supply may be a five kilometer walk away, ADRA drills boreholes, installs water tanks, pumps and gravity fed water systems. Being able to collect water just a few steps from your home makes all the difference. It is the goal of ADRA to teach people the skills they need to become independently food secure. Training, drought resistant seeds and tools help them get started on a lifelong journey of food assurance. Techniques of organic gardening provide growing children with an abundance of nutritious, healthy food. Often people find that they can grow much more than they eat and are able to sell their excess produce for much needed income. ADRA teaches people small business accounting and then skills training in horticulture, animal husbandry, craft production, food processing and how to run small buy and sell shops. Low interest loans from ADRA help them get started. It doesn't take long before these new entrepreneurs are able to proudly exclaim that they now have enough money to send their kids to school. Every year, the dreams of millions of children are dashed because they're taken out of school to help their parents at home. ADRA believes strongly that a quality education is the key to breaking cycles of poverty. In small group sessions, ADRA explains to parents all the extended opportunities that their children will have if they get a good education. Thanks to the encouragement of ADRA, children, including girls, are going back to school. In 
all of this, you have played a vital part. Through your generous support, you have partnered with the work of Christ, the work of ADRA. As the newly elected president of the British Union, I'm also the chairman of ADRA UK's board. I may be a new face of leadership at ADRA UK, but I have been involved with ADRA for many years, not only as a supporter, but also I had the privilege of traveling to Burkina Faso in 2009 to see the work of ADRA firsthand. There is, and will always be, a con close connection between the church and the work of ADRA. In fact, ADRA can only exist if we as church members support this important work we are doing, not only overseas, but also supporting local church community hubs here in UK. Brexit, aid cuts by the, the government, and the pandemic have put ADRA in a challenging financial position. ADRA really needs your support. And did you know that for every pound that you raise for overseas projects, you can get £10 match funding. So please set some money aside to donate to ADRA today. May God bless you as you bless ADRA. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath to you all. And those that are watching online, happy Sabbath to you. I just have a few announcements to bring to your attention. So Grantham opening day will be taking place on the 4th of September. Now for those of you that don't know, Grantham open day is where we can purchase various um, biblical literature um, for your own home or for your church. So that will be taking place on the 4th of September. Now if you'd like some transportation to get there, Brother Smiley will be putting on a coach at a, at a cost. Um, so if you would like his information, please see me and I will pass on his information and you can reserve your seat on the coach. So that's Grantham, the 4th of September. We have members trans requesting transfer in and out of Wolverhampton. So today will be the first reading and I will bring those to your attention now. So Sister Sylvia Harper would like to transfer her membership from Wolverhampton Central to Basildon Wickford, which is in London. Also, Kyrianna Costley and Caleb Costley, brother and sister, would like to transfer their membership from Wolverhampton Central to Aberdeen. And transferring in, Sister Smith, so that's Tara Smith, would like to transfer her membership from Pendiford to here, Wolverhampton Central. I don't think any of those individuals are here this morning, but these, this is the first reading, and next week we will do the vote. So next week's Sabbath is the 13th of August. So who can tell me what's happening on the 13th of August? I think I heard about two people say baptism. Anybody else would like to tell me what is happening on the 13th of August here in Wolverhampton Central? Can we say it with a bit of confidence? Well, for those of you who don't know, there will be a baptism here in Wolverhampton Central next week's Sabbath. Right, I'll do that announcement again. Next week's Sabbath, the 13th of August, there will be a baptism here in Wolverhampton Central. Amen. And the waters will be troubled by four individuals. Amen. Four individuals. And those individuals, can you please stand when I call your name? So, Sister Laura. Amen. Brother Tyrese. Amen. Sister Chismia. I don't know if she's here, Chismia. No. And also Ryan. Ryan, would you like to stand? So these individuals will be troubling the waters of baptism. And it will be a, ha a happy day next week's Sabbath. Well, every Sabbath is a happy day. But next week's Sabbath, these individuals have said no to the world and yes to Jesus. And we are truly happy. So can you come forward, please? Because the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he will devour. And now you have made this public declaration that you would like to be baptized. The devil will tr trouble you. Amen. But God will be by your side through and through. So I'm asking if one of the elders can pray for these candidates. What a great sight. Amen. What a fantastic sight.
Laura, Tyrese, Ryan, Chismere, this is just a dress rehearsal. Next Sabbath, all being well, it'll be the real thing. Um, but God bless your decision. The church is right behind you. But more importantly, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the host of heaven is also right beside you. God bless you. I'll make this fantastic choice for him this morning. Let's pray for our candidates together. Please bow our heads. Dear God, thank you so much for a great celebration you've given to us this morning. There are four individuals who have chosen to follow you publicly and to tell people they love you with all their heart and soul and mind. Father, I pray that as they move forward to next Sabbath all being well, that you will bless them and keep them. Shine your face upon them. Just solidify their decision this morning and make them to be a blessing wherever they may go, that people will see that they have been in the presence of a true and living God. Bless Laura. Bless Tyrese. Bless Ryan. Bless Chesmia. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, today is the 6th of August. It's not the 13th yet. There is still seven days to go. Now, anybody who wants to be baptized, contact any of the elders of Pastor Nicholson. There is still time. There is still time on the, on the platform, Facebook and YouTube. There is still time. Seven more days to go. May God help you to make a decision for him and to follow these four where God is leading them. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And the baptismal service will be in divine service. So it won't be in the afternoon. It will be in divine service. Also, next week's Sabbath in the evening at 6 p.m., there will be a praise and thanksgiving program put on here at Wolverhampton Central by the youth of this church. So you're all welcome to come back to the praise and thanksgiving evening next Sabbath at 6 p.m. And finally, any birthdays this past week? I know, Carol, did you celebrate a birthday this week? Yes, you did. I won't ask you how old you are, but happy birthday from us here at Wolverhampton Central. Last week's Sabbath, I believe, Sis Elder Kerr and her husband celebrated a wedding anniversary. So happy anniversary to those individuals. And Elder Mark and his wife celebrated their wedding anniversary last week Sunday, so... Congratulations to you. Anybody else celebrating anything? Life? Life, health and strength. So we'll sing happy birthday to, to Carol. birthday everybody god bless you all carol and co very quickly at the time i've spoken to you more than once now regarding the upkeep of the church and how i want to have this church back to its former glory time is running out the work will start very soon with what we have so far we have to bring god's church back to where it should be where it can be where it must be so please i'm asking again to see sister taylor sister otty sister brown and give them your, your brown paper and your blue paper and those pinky ones starting with five. Give them what you have that we can rebuild or make this church what it should be, what it must be for God's glory. It's a short appeal of this morning. I'll come back to you next time with all being one with more. But please, let's make God's sanctuary what it must be for his honor and glory today. Sister Brown, Sister Taylor and Sister Artie. See those three, please, with your gifts for our church. God bless you, and we now go into a divine service. Let us all stand and sing 
uh, in Detroit one more time, one more time. He allowed us to come together one more time. Let's see. talk for anybody else but it's been a trying week it's the, the devil doesn't want us to be here right now but it's through your mercy and through your grace that we're here and so lord today i'm asking that you will give each and every one of us a born again experience that we will be born again thank you lord fill us with your holy spirit amen, amen. one more time One more time, one more time, he allowed us to come together. One more time, one more time, one more time, he allowed us to come together. One more time, one more time. One more time, one more time, one more time, he allows us to sing together. One more time, one more time, one more time, he allows us to pray together. One more time, one more time, one more time, he allows us to pray together, one more time. Please be seated. Good morning, church. And a happy Sabbath. It's good to be at Central Church. I'm just enjoying myself. I wasn't here last week, but I'm here this week. And I'm really having a hallelujah time. Just want to welcome one and all in the house of the Lord. One more time, the Lord has allowed us to come and worship together. And that's what we're going to do, worship together. We also acknowledge those of our friends that are worshiping with us, singing with us virtually. The Lord can see you, and the Lord has got blessings for you as well, so be blessed. 
We will now stand up one more time as we sing the opening song, hymn number 159. Amen. The old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. 159. Father, we pray for peace. We pray, dear Father, that you may bless us. We pray, dear Father, that we may just bask in your glory. We pray, dear Father, for this opportunity to worship you, to, to just praise you, Lord. For hold back, therefore, dear Father, we pray, all the winds of turbulence. Let nothing steal our joy and our worship. Be with us, dear Father. 
Let your holy presence fill this place and fill with the speaker and everybody, including those, dear Father, that are worshiping with us virtually. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Who believes it's sweet? Who can feel his joy, his love around us? Five, two, four. announcement if you do hear the alarm you've got the fire exit on my left and right at the back and we'll all meet by the subway and there's a health and safety exit right here for those at the front we don't plan a, there's no fire alarm testing today but if you do hear it we all do need to evacuate immediately thank you good morning and happy sabbath church I hope you've all had a good week. It's now time for our tithes and offering. As the deacons come forward, a scripture we can think about is Luke 6, verse 38, which says, Give and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, full and running over. For in the same measure as you give, it shall be given to you. So I encourage you to give from your hearts wholeheartedly.
It was Jesus who said his father's house is a house of prayer. We love singing, we love worshiping, but it's not complete without prayer. What do you say? And so we're going to pray. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, he prayed. But what I like about his prayer was that he was not praying for himself. He was praying for us. And so at this moment, I'm going to ask, if possible, pray for somebody else. Amen? Pray for somebody else. But for us, corporately, together, may I ask Elder Green to come and commit the church and pray for the church. We've got all kind of issues that need the divine intervention. Am I the only one who's got issues? Am I the only one? No. Certainly not. Elder Green, he's right at the back. Sweet hour of prayer as we prepare ourselves to talk to the Lord. Remember, if possible, please pray for somebody else. Amen. and most eternal Father in heaven. We thank you this morning for this opportunity that as a people we can come together to call upon your name. We thank you, dear Lord, for the power and the privilege of prayer. We know that we said much prayer, we have much power. And at this time we pray, Lord, that you will anoint us with your Holy Spirit. And help us, O oh God, that our thoughts will be centered upon you at this moment. You have called this morning a young man to minister unto your people. And we know that you have endowed him, O oh God, with a double portion of your spirit that as he speaks to us today, we will see Jesus speaking through him. I pray, O oh God, that you will continue to protect him and guide him as he study your words and as he study his work, O oh God, in order to enhance him to be a better young man in this community and in this world. Lord, I know that you, are, you have equipped him for service in your work. We understand even last week he was down there in London at the church, but as he preaching your words. Lord, you have called him for this purpose. And I pray that as he speaks to us today, oh God, you will... Bow, please. Amen. 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 Yeah, that's what we do in Africa. We, we, we take a bow as an honor, you know, showing respect for the church. Busi is a very well-talented girl. I see greatness in her. 
I see her one day being a shining star in our land. And I do pray and hope that we will continue to support the parents. We have seen her during the child's ministries on our YouTube and Facebook. Very, very well talented. And I, I hope we will, you know, um, nurture. Thank you, dear sister. I'm English. We will nurture the talent and uh, realize it it's to its full potential. Um, Ruth, she's taken a break, never mind. Uh, she's done her part, so she's somewhere in, 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 in the... In the in. She, she, she promoted the tithe and offering. Um, one of our own, uh, it's beautiful to see our children doing so much. Uh, I'm, I'm even careful now calling them children. Um, our preacher this morning is Brother Antoine. There is a rich history about Antoine. It was the birth of Antoine that marked a major change in the life of the mother. It was shortly after the birth of Antoine that the mother remembered that there is a sanctuary. She's always been an Adventist, but you know, there are twists and turns in life. And it was shortly after the birth of Antoine that she said, enough is enough. I will go back to the church. And he was still a little baby when the mother was baptized. Amen. We did not see this coming. But here we are. My dear sister, may the Lord bless you and continue to work in you. Don't give up. Don't look back, but press forward. Brother Antoine will preach to us today. He's got older brothers, older siblings, but he's the baby of the family. But not today. He will be breaking the bread and feeding us all. And so let's commit him to our prayers. I will ask Sister Busi to come and do the scripture reading. And after that, uh, I'll ask the praise team to give us or lead us in one song at least, or two, as uh, Brother Antoine is warming up to break the bread. You must be born again, is the same one title today. Busi will come and uh, read the scripture for us. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, Church. Today's scripture reading comes from Romans 8, verse 11. Once you find it, may you please say amen. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. your mercy never fails me all my days i've been held in your hands from the moment that i wake up until i lay my head oh i will sing of the goodness of god All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With 
every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and darkest nights. You are close like no you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God cause all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good to be here another week another day to be here good morning and happy Sabbath God has been merciful He's given us another day to praise his name before I go any further let, let's go to his throne of mercy and grace dear kind Heavenly Father thank you for the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful all our lives you have been so good with every breath that we are able I'm sure Lord I'm sure that you have been merciful to each and every one of us in this house today 
because if that was not so, we would not be living right now, Lord. So thank you for what you have done, what you're doing, and what you're going to continue to do. Thank you. May I be your vessel today to be used by you. Prepare our hearts, our minds, and our souls to receive your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The topic for today is spiritual death. How we can be in the church, be Christians or professed Christians, but yet still be walking dead. Let's turn back to the scripture reading, Romans chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. Romans chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. And I'll read in your hearing, Romans 8, 10 and 11. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Brothers and sisters, spiritual death is very prevalent in the world today, in the church today. Sister White says a revival and a reformation must take place place unto the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Last time I was here, I spoke to you on the walk of the Holy Spirit in our lives, how, how, how much we need that in our hearts and in our, our life today. And to reach our part, God, God wants us to go under, to, 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 to take part in a revival and a reformation. Revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies a renewal of spiritual life a quickening of the powers, mind, and heart. A resurrection from spiritual death. Just like our scripture reading, when we are revived, we receive a quickening. A quickening. What does the word quickening mean? In medically, many, some of you may have heard of the word resuscitate. Church, spiritually, we need a spiritual resuscitation. We need a spiritual resuscitation. We need to be brought back from spiritual death. Because I don't know about you, but I know that sometimes I can be spiritually dead. But that's what Christ came to save us from. Reformation signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas, habits, and practices. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruits of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the Spirit. Revival and reformation need to go together. You have to be revived, renewed, reformed. Sometimes we talk about health reform. Before we can go to health reform, we should have a spiritual reform in our lives. Revival and reformation are to do their appointed work, and in doing this, they must blend. Wolverhampton, you are to be revived from spiritual death, as our key text suggests. Now with that in mind, turn to 2 Kings chapter 13, 21. 2 Kings chapter 13, 21. Do I read in your hearing? 2 Kings Chapter 13 and 21, it says, And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that, behold, they spied a band of men and cast him into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he, what's that word, church? He revived and stood up on his feet. Brothers, there is power in this text, not only physically, but spiritually. When we touch the source of God's power, when we touch the source of God's power, we will revise, stand up on his feet and go into the field of God's work. Amen. What is the definition of death? Because before we can go to curing death, we need to know spiritual death. We need to know what it really is. 
We're going to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, 5 and 6. It says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hatred, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have part of anything in anything that happened under the sun. Ecclesiastes 9 five and six spiritual death is very similar when you when somebody dies they can't come to you and say something to you because they are dead they're six feet under or if they're not dead they could be anywhere they they're dead and, and that's the end they live and know that they will die but they're dead no not anything when we are spiritually dead the dead know not anything Spiritual death is very similar to physical death. It's when, when, when prevalent in somebody's life, it dumbs the senses from sin as he steps deeper and deeper, indulges in sin more and more. His conscience becomes quiet and the Holy Spirit can no longer dwell in him. We are all sanctuaries. What are you a sanctuary of? What is in you? The sanctuary is made to hold God's spirit in us. But what are we allowing to, to pollute us? What are we holding in God? If the spirit of Christ is not in us, what is there? King Saul, who at first was filled with the spirit, went downhill and allowed himself to go into a state of spiritual death. The prophet Samuel says concerning Saul in 1 Samuel 15, 22, turn there in your Bibles, 1 Samuel 15, 22, and Samuel says, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. If we have a spiritual death, we can't obey God. It's as simple as that. But as I spoke of last time, Jesus has come to save us. I have not come here just to tell you how bad sin is, because I'm sure we all know how bad sin is, because the, the lives that we live each day and what we see and we go through each day can tell us how bad sin is. I've not come to tell you that, because you know that already. I've come to tell you that God is greater than your sins. It doesn't matter how dead you think you are. What can make us alive again? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. John 3.16, a very well-known passage says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish in spiritual death, and eventually physical death will have everlasting life. Everlasting life. I want to partake of everlasting life. Do you want to take of, take, partake of everlasting life? In a secret, um, in a secret conversation at night with Nicodemus, Jesus stated something very, very profound. John chapter 3, verses 3, let's turn there in our Bibles. Jesus says, and I said unto him, John 3, verses 3, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So it's stated plainly, except. The word, the word except has only one meaning, except. Only if you are born again, you can enter the kingdom of God. When truth becomes an abiding principle in the life, the soul is born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The new birth is the result of receiving Christ as the word of God. When by the Holy Spirit, divine truths are impressed upon the heart, new conceptions are awakened and energized hitherto, dormant are aroused to cooperate with God. Will you cooperate with God? 
will you follow his way path and go his way or will you go otherwise we need a reformation so that our hearts may not we all all of us are flesh is our biggest enemy self is our biggest enemy we can we can we can run away from people other things but we can't run away from ourselves no matter where you go you're gonna be with yourself <laughs> and that's that's our damn vote. are we gonna heed to self are we gonna heed to the flesh as the bible calls it are we gonna heed to me am i going to heed to my my my, my earthly passions or am i going to be reformed revived renewed are new concepts in me going to be awakened or are we going to stay as Laodicea? Our spiritual state is likened to the church of Laodicea. We are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. And today, as we see, we are spiritually dead. And if we stay in this path, we are going to physically die. But these are the people Christ came to save. Because to your wretchedness, he gives a clean heart. To your miserableness, he gives happiness. And to our need, he gives righteousness. Ezekiel 37. The bones of Elisha. Ezekiel 37. Revival and reformation. Let's turn to Ezekiel 37. We'll start at verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 37, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit. This is Ezekiel talking and set me down in the midst of a valley that was full of bones. What do you see in this church? If the spirit is not here, all of us here are just dry bones. And cause me to pass by them round about and behold there were very many in the open valley and lo they were very dry and he said unto me son of man can these bones live and i answered oh lord thou knowest again he said unto me prophesy upon these bones and say unto them O ye dry bones hear the word of the lord that's what christ says to you O ye dry bones hear the word of the lord thus saith the lord unto these bones behold i will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live and i will lay sinews the flesh upon you and bring flesh upon you and you and cover you with sin and skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that i am the lord so i prophesied as i was commanded and as i prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking a shaking the holy spirit is moving just like pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes, a great wind comes, there will be a shaking. And the bones came together, bone upon bone, bone to his bone. And when I behold, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was not breath in them. Some of us are to this state where we may have the flesh upon us and our skin upon us spiritually, but there's no breath in us. The spirit is not abiding in us. But then, he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy son of man, and say unto the wind, thus saith the Lord, come forth for winds, O breath, and breathe upon the slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up and stood upon their feet and an exceeding army when breath comes into us each one of us doesn't matter your age your gender whatever where you come from what you've done you will become a great mighty army brothers and sisters in church we may be confessing god with our mouths and our hearts but uh mouths but our hearts are far away from him and we are just like dry bones but just like how we just read god has come to raise us to draw us closer to himself to his heart 
Brothers and sisters, man and child, if we continue in this way, death will be the outcome. But then, verses 11, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, the whole house of Wolverhampton Central. Behold, all my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of, up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. We need to reach the point where we can look up and say, you are God and there is no other. I cannot heed my flesh, but I will follow your spirit. Until we reach that point, we're just dry bones. We are just dry bones. God says he will open our graves and we will come out. He will put his spirit in us, verse 14, and he shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and shall place you in your own land. Then ye shall know that I, the Lord, has spoken and performed it, saith the Lord. So you see, except a man be born again, rebirth. What does born again mean? Because we may say, but what does the true, real meaning mean? Let's go back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're going we're gonna to read this over again with, with what, we just, what, we just, what we just read in our hearts. John chapter 3. And we're going to start at verses 2. Then, then, same came to Je- then the same Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher, come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be old how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus was taking this literal. He, he was thinking grown men were to go into their mother's womb. I don't think that would have worked. And if, if your mother was dead, that means that there was no hope for you. But spiritual rebirth was more than going back into your mother's room, just like what Nicodemus thought. Verse 4, verse 5, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus gives him more insight, being born of the water and of the Spirit. Being baptized, being bored physically, but then the spirits. If these things are separate, it won't work. It's together, being born of water and of the spirits. Then can a man enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is what? And that which is born of the spirit is what? So I wouldn't be on the spirit side. So I have to be born of the spirit, not of the flesh. I have to leave my life of flesh behind. But I have to be born again by the spirit of God. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. You must be born again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in all of thy house. Acts 16, 31. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is what Jesus says to each of Each of these scriptures, every time we read the Bible, we should remember this is the word of the Lord to us. This is God's efforts to revive you, to resuscitate you from spiritual death. This is what Christ says to you. He says, be changed, revived, be cleansed. Heed what I say unto you. Revelation, remember we are like laid to see, but Christ says to you, listen to me, heed when I say, buy of me gold tried in the fire so you be not poor, be, that you mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes salve that thou mayest see. Revelation 3 verses 18. Christians should be repetitive. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. We have the word of God. And if we're not going to use it, there's no point being in church. Until we sit down and take time to read his word. The things that are coming upon the world, if we do not study God's word, we will not know when they are coming. We will not be able to look forward for the signs to see, okay, this is happening. Wars, rumors of wars, pestilences. I can see that happening. I can see that happening. So that means Jesus says when these things are happening, my coming is near. Now we will be able to see because we have been studying, we have been reading, and we'll be able to see the coming of God. But if we do not, it will come upon us as a surprise. There's many animals that use that. Many, I love nature, and and I love to watch different stuff, documentaries about animals, and certain animals use tactics. They use the element of surprise. And that's what the devil's using. The element of surprise. We won't, if we don't study his world, we will walk into territory we should not be, and he will surprise us, attack us. That's why Christ says, study the word of God. Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. And this preparation, they should be made by diligently studying the word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. Even though we should read our Bible and study the word in it, That's not enough. Until we apply apply it to our lives, because we can read and read and read, but go down the same path that we've been going on for the the past years and the 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 past days of our lives. But until we apply it, there is no difference. We are still spiritually dead. We we may have the, the flesh upon us. We may look. We may look like Christians. We may pretend to be Christians. This is no time to play church. This is no time to act church. This is time to be, to live. God calls for a revival and a reformation. The time has come for a thorough reformation to take place. When this reformation begins, the spirit of prayer will actuate every believer and will banish from the church spirits of discord and strife. A revival and a reformation is what is needed in the world today. We are spiritually dead, we are dry bones, as we've learned today. For God said not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, 17. Revival in health, in mind, in body, and spirit is necessary for the kingdom. For nature, for the nature we are born in is carnal. For behold, Psalm 51 says, Psalm 51 verse 5, let's go there, Psalm 51 verses 5. Behold, I was shapen, I was made in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. We were born sinners. We were born sinners. But that's what, that's why Jesus came to save us. If we were born Christians, if we were born the real deal, why would Christ need to, to give up his life for no reason? It's for a reason that he came and died. Because in sin, where we bored, we are shut out by our carnal minds. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Romans 8 verses 7. In our scripture reading, Romans 8, a quickening is described. This word means in the Hebrew to resuscitate, to, 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 to make alive, to revive. Let's go back to the beginning, the moment where God blew breath into Adam. That same breath 
is what we need today. We, 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 we were born in the beginning. God made us in, 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 with no sin. But we, as human beings, stepped into sin. And Christ had to come and save us from our sin. Not in our sin, but from our sin. And we need the breath of life in our hearts and our minds today so that we may be saved from sin and death. The same breath that Ezekiel prophesied about in the, val the parable of the valley of dry bones. A rebirth, as our title suggests, born again. We need to be born again. So brothers and sisters, remember, life cannot be fulfilled without him who is the way, the truth, and the life. What are you living for, church? Which, each one of you, this is a question to ask yourself. What are you living for? Are, if you're living, it's, you're just living to die. I'm being honest. If you're living in sin, you're just living to die. But that, that, that's not it. The way, the truth, and the life everlasting life is what he offers to you if you just believe in him you will not perish but have everlasting life we are walking dead without him so today be changed be renewed ask the spirit to dwell in you my last scripture is revelation 21 verses 4 and this is what we have to look forward to Revelation 21 verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That means there, there should be, there are tears in our eyes because of sin. God, God has come to wipe away tears. How can Christ wipe away tears that aren't there? Tears will be in our lives. This, this shows that it's not going to be easy. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow. Nor cry, neither shall there be any more pain, for former things are passed away. Revelation 21 4. Are you gonna you're gonna hold on to the things of this world? Hold on to sin? Are you gonna let it go? Are you gonna let it go? And hold on to Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen, church. Somebody is not happy. We've been blessed. But the devil is not happy. He doesn't want this young man to remain in the faith. He doesn't want him to continue in this avenue. Come on, elder, come pray for our preacher and the rest of our children. That the Lord preserve them. Amen. Shall we join in prayer as we bow our heads in the prayer? The preacher held our prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have heard you speaking to us today. You choose the vessel that you choose. You take even the youngest of the youngest, Lord, to open up the words of everlasting life. And we appreciate so much that you have just saturated Antoine, Lord, with your Holy Spirit today. He has spoken for you. He has worked for you. He has not been afraid of our faces, but he has been true to his heavenly calling. And he's opened up towards us, Lord, the word of eternal life. Father, I pray that you will just take him day by day and day by day. Touch him. Renew him. Strengthen him. Revive him. Uh, may he be a weapon of mass destruction against the powers that come into this world. 
may he be used by you again and again to open up the words of eternal life and as he speaks may our hearts burn within us and may we contemplate that we have been in the presence of living God for his manservant has brought him here Father, I pray now that you will take 10,000 angels and surround him and protect him from the evil one. As Elder Naomi said, the devil is not happy, but we don't care. The devil is not pleased, but we are not troubled. For the rod and the staff will be with Antoine all the days of his life. I pray that we'll use him again, Wolverhampton, London. Take him wherever, whether on a mountain top or in a valley somewhere. Take this young boy. Protect him and use him. Sanctify him for your service. And as he speaks, may hearts and minds be changed. That we will walk in the way of Jesus Christ. I pray not just for him, but for all our children, Lord. Oh God, Satan hates when they sing and preach and speak for you. But Heavenly Father, protect them when they go out and when they come in. Renew them day by day by the power of your Holy Spirit. And use our children in these last days to finish the work that has to be finished. That people will know that you, your son, are on your way. So keep them in all your ways now, Lord. And as parents and as guardians, as uncles and aunties and grandparents, may we pray for them. May we sit with them. May we tabernacle with them. And may our children not only be seen, but in these last days, may our children be heard. That they can go forward, Lord, to proclaim the way of salvation. Thank you, Lord, for Antoine. Thank you for our children. Thank you for our church. May we leave this place refreshed, revived, and reformed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Lord is at work at Central Church, you know. Um, we didn't see this, but uh, thank God for Antoine. And thank God for Keisha. Where, where, where is Keisha? Where, where is? Thank God for you, my dear. Um, let us continue, dear brethren, praying for our mothers, mothers of our children that you know um, they continue committing our children into the hands of the Lord. Our closing song is 163 but before we start it I believe we have a new addition to the house of the Lord. Sister Fumi, am I right? Brought a newborn for the first time ever into the house of the Lord. Um, are you there Sister Fumi? Can 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 rise a bit, rise so we can bless you. Amen, amen. The house of the Lord is growing bigger and bigger. May the Lord bless you and cause His face to shine upon you, dear sister. For me, the closing song is one six three. May we rise as we sing.
Thank you, may the church please sit down. I'm not here next week, so I might as well punish you. <laughs> now, the younger Kisha will give us an anchor after which the preacher will give us a benediction. Is that all right? So the younger of the two Kishas can, will come now and give us a, 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 another song. Come, 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 come. Come sing for us. That's an echo, and then after that, the preacher will give us a, a, a benediction. Amen. It's up to you. Your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God cause all my life you have been faithful and all my So, so good. 
Amen, church. Let's pray. Lord, amen. Lord, it's been good. Thank you, Lord. We agree with what you have done today. I pray that our hearts, our minds, our souls and our bodies may be in sync with your way and with your will. So Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the word that you have spoken today. Thank you for the songs that have been sang to your glory. Thank you for all that has been done in this church. And may, as we leave, our hearts may not leave from you, but stay and draw closer, nearer and nearer, still nearer to you. I thank you, Lord, and I praise you in Jesus' wonderful and loving name. Amen. We will leave the church as the praise team leads us. Thank you.